going first this morning. Before we get started with announcements, a special welcome to any visitors we have with us. And if you are a visitor, we'd like you to take your order of service. There's this extra portion. Fill that out, tear it off, place an offering plate, which is past fine in a few minutes, so we can find out some ways that our church family can reach out to you. Also, just a real few quick announcements. I've had a lot of people ask about tonight. Um, we're going to have services here tonight at 4 o'clock, so you'll be able to get home. <laughs> you'll be able to get home well in time uh, for, the, for the kickoff. So youth will be here at 4, adults will be here at 4, um, we'll have our time of Bible study and everybody will be able to get home before that uh, kickoff of the Super Bowl. We all room for it. Nobody. So many people, so many people have said that. It's either nobody or against Patriots. So that's what I've heard. Um, coming up this coming Saturday, this coming Saturday is True Hope Helping Hands. Um, we need some workers for that. So if you'd like to be a part of that, you'd like to help out with that ministry, talk to one of our staff uh, or Ms. Garnett. She can give you some more information about that ministry. But we do need help uh, for that for this Saturday. That's from 8 to 11. I guarantee you, if you come out and be a part of that ministry, you'll enjoy it. You'll walk away blessed. It's a great time of service for our community. Again, please, please be in prayer for helping out with that ministry. Also, on Sunday evenings, Sunday evenings, the youth, we have a time of Bible study, but before we have that time of Bible study, we have a time of fellowship and food. Um, that meal on Sunday night takes a big chunk out of our youth budget. So if you'd like to help out in any form or fashion of that, you can talk to myself or, again, one of our staff. Um, we could really use maybe like your Sunday school class or uh, just a group of couples could come together. And even if you just helped out like one Sunday a month, that would take a big portion um, and help out. Again, talk to myself or one of our staff. We can give you some more information on that. Um, any other announcements I'm forgetting to draw attention to? Keep your bulletin close by this week. Um, for upcoming dates, the calendar we put out last week, so keep that in mind as well. Anything else? Okay, we'll, I'll turn it over to Brother Jerry, then we'll have our time of fellowship. This is Travis Key, and Travis was uh, actually baptized as a child, and uh, he comes today because uh, he didn't believe he fully understood <coughs> what he was doing back then, and so he wants to to get his, you know, some, some point between uh, when he was a child and now, he is trusted in Christ alone for salvation. And so he wants to fall through a believer's baptism. And he's wrote a, a brief testimony here. He said, a Christian is a person who wholeheartedly trusts in Jesus' promise, a person who seeks to follow him in obedience. And I have fell short of that for a very long time. Until a couple years ago, I hadn't stepped in church or even turned to God in years. The past couple years, God has blessed me with a beautiful wife, three amazing kids, a home we can call ours. Good job, stood on the table, and God fearing God loving church. If it wasn't for God and the love He has given me in my family, I don't know where I would be. I give thanks to God for His amazing grace and having mercy on me.
Yes.
Dear Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for this day and for each and every one who is here in your house this morning. Lord, I pray now that there will be someone here that doesn't know you as your Lord and Savior, that your Holy Spirit comes upon them and fills their heart with me. Lord, I also pray that you be with your church and also that you be with this offering, that you bless those who give it. And, and I pray, Lord, that you bless this offering to reach out to those around us. For these things we pray in your name. Amen.
you're going to start it, Hank. I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to do. Starting a party right here. Yeah, or a party. Right here. Yeah, you know, you know what it is. brothers for you right there. All right, come back and sit down. You got it? Okay, you're the messenger. What do we say? God communicates with us. All right, how does God, does God communicate with us? He doesn't do it like this, does he? Because his message would have gotten a little bit confusing. But you know what? That's actually how he did communicate originally. You know what? Come on, that's You know how he did that? They passed it along from, from one person to the next. All right, let me ask you another question. Do anybody know who Joseph was about? Who was it? Oh, that was that. You're true. You're right. How about several years before that, there was another Joseph. They had a really pretty coat. Somebody remember that story? Anyway, he got sold into slavery in Egypt, and God communicated to him through dreams. Alright? How does God communicate to us today? By telephone? No? Text? Email? No? Do what? Prayers? Okay. Well, in John, the glasses now. Basically, I forgot the reference, but Jesus said, I'll send someone or something to communicate with you. He sent the Holy Spirit, and he and, and he called him the Counselor, and the Counselor will tell us what to do. There are ways that there are a lot of different ways that we can learn to communicate with God. One of them is by reading the Bible. One of them is by prayer, and you know another one is through listening to other people. Did he listen to me, guys? Just for a second, real quick. Did anybody hear what Brother Jerry read this morning before Travis got baptized? What was that called? You might remember. What was it? That was his testimony. And you know how we, and you know, so you know what Travis did when he did that, when he wrote that out? He was telling us how God affected his life. And you know, by telling others, he may influence somebody else to even think about that or know that God helps them. And he helps Travis. He helps me just like he helped Travis. And that, that that's a testimony. And that's what that's one way that God communicates with us is through somebody else, okay? So let's, let's, have, let's try to remember to do that. And you know another way that our testimony works? It's not by just listening to what we say, but by what? You know? 
reading the Bible, but also by watching what we do. Okay? That's another way that that uh, that, G, that that God communicates to us is by putting people in our lives who show us what to do. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for, for today. We thank you for, Lord, for you talking to us and communicating with us, and we thank you for that. We ask that you continue to do that. Lord, just help us to listen to when you're talking to us. In your name we pray. Amen.
your Bibles to Genesis 1. Thank you for that truth this morning, man. We need to be looking at truth and looking to the sky for Christ to return. We're in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and I'm going to seek to answer the question uh, this morning. When does an embryo become a baby? When does an embryo become a baby? Now, this subject is near and dear to my heart and has been for a long time uh, because I believe God is the one who determines uh, when human life begins, and God is the one who determines um, the value of a human being, the value of a human person. And um, I hope that you're encouraged here today that God has not been silent on the issue. God's been very clear in His Word. Um, you, you think of when the Bible was written and how long ago it was written and how God provided enough information for us to understand, um, regardless what science says or regardless what politicians say. Um, the Bible is very clear concerning when an embryo becomes a baby. And the answer is that an embryo is always a baby. Um, and so I'm going to try to examine from Scripture and prove that uh, reality here this morning. But to start us off, I want to read. Um, this was an a, uh, article written by a feminist writer. This was just three, three years after Roe versus Wade. And um, this was posted under the pseudonym Jane Doe in the New York Times, but it was later published in a book um, of essays, and this lady revealed her name. Her, her name is Linda Bird Frank, and um, then she, she's describing her own abortion. She says, Though I would march myself into blisters for a woman's right to exercise the option of motherhood, I discovered there in the waiting room that I was not the modern woman I thought I was. When my name was called, my body felt so heavy, the nurse had to help me into the examining room. I waited for my husband to burst through the door and yell, stop, but of course he didn't. I concentrated on three black spots in the acoustic ceiling until they grew into the size of saucers, while the doctor swabbed me with antiseptic. You're going to feel a burning sensation now, he said, injecting Novocaine into the neck of the womb. The pain was swift and severe, and I twisted to get away from him. He was hurting my baby, I reasoned. And the black saucers quivered in the air. Stop, I cried. Please stop. He shook his head, busy with his equipment. It's too late to stop now, he said. It'll take just a few more seconds. What good sports we women are and how obedient. Physically, the pain passed even before the hum of the machine signals that the vacuuming was completed. My baby sucked up like ashes after a cocktail party. Ten minutes start to finish, and I was back on the arm of the nurse. There were 12 beds in the recovery room. Each one had a galley flowered draw sheet and soft green or blue thermal blanket. It was all very feminine. Lying on these beds for an hour or more were the shocked victims of their life, their full wounds now stripped clean, their futures less encumbered. Finally then, it was time for me to leave. My husband was slumped in the waiting room, clutching a single yellow rose wrapped in wet paper towel and stuffed into a baggie. We didn't talk all the way home. My husband and I are back to planning our summer vacation now on his career switch. It certainly does make more sense not to be having a baby right now. We say that to each other all the time. But I have this ghost now, a very little ghost that only appears when I'm seeing something beautiful, like a full moon on the ocean last weekend. And the baby waves at me, and I wave at the baby. Of course we have room, I cry to the ghost. Of course we do. And it just, it really weighs on me because not only are we, not only this issue is about babies, human beings, it's also about the women who have been lied to and told that the, that the embryo, that a baby is not a human being. Because you, you cannot, you can tamp down your conscience and tamp down your conscience and tamp down your conscience. But this lady knows the reality when her conscience rises up and says she's, she's being followed. So there's this real reality that um, we need to fight for the lives of the unborn. But we also need to fight for the women who have been lied to and told. You know, there's a real grief that comes with this decision. A real lifelong ghost that follows these women around. And um, I want to encourage y'all to think through this. Abortion has a human toll, not only in the lives that are lost, but also in the mothers and the fathers and the doctors and nurses who have participated in these things. And so with that said, let us read in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. 
God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And so the first thing we need to see is that in the beginning, God made mankind body and soul, male and female, in his image. And so the purpose of man was to mirror him. And so in this creation, man has a uh, physical, <clears throat> physical reality and an immaterial reality. Um, so we have body and soul. We are made up of body and soul. And it's interesting, he, he and my son, you'll notice if you're taking your children through the catechism, uh, four and five year olds, their final question uh, this week is um, what else did God give Adam and Eve after talking about God made Adam from the ground and Eve from the body of Adam it says that he gave them a soul that can never die and uh, a soul that's eternal and then the question that's going to come next week is do you have a body and soul a soul that can never die and the answer of course is yes and um, this immaterial Reality is true as well. And so with that, I want you to turn over. So we see the value of man comes from God, mankind, man, male and female. And what I'm trying to argue, what I'm trying to present is that it doesn't matter your age or your location that all human beings are equally valuable. So it doesn't matter if you're inside the womb or you're outside the womb. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in a nursing home, uh, if you're hooked up to machines, you know, Human value comes from God. It is not determined based on brain function, based on whether or not your heart is beating. It, it, it is not determined by any of these relative things where scientists try to determine. It is objectively determined by God. God is the one who determines the value of a human being. Not us, and not how they benefit society, and not the choice of a mother or a father. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus 21. Exodus 21. And uh, something interesting about Israel, you know, with, with the things that we have studied about the laws, and, and you see atheists and, and those today in the 21st century are wanting, they want to wag their finger at the Bible and, and act like our morality is somehow better than the Old Testament. Um, but, the, but the Old Testament cared more about the unborn than America does. Exodus 21, beginning in verse 22. And, you know, and this is some 3,000 years ago when this was written. Uh, Exodus 21, 22. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her child comes out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judge is determined. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, Burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And so if uh, two men are fighting and the pregnant woman goes into labor and the baby dies, the men's lives are to be taken from them. That's what the Bible says. That's what that was Old Testament civil law. And uh, what does that say about how the Israelites valued the unborn and how God values the unborn? I believe this is the first mention of an eye for an eye uh, in Israel or in the Bible. And so... You know, what's interesting is that since the decision of Roe versus Wade, over 60 million babies have been aborted just in the United States. To put this in perspective, there are 300, over 328 million people living in the United States today. And so that's a little under 20% of the U.S. population today. So imagine if, you know, nuclear bomb and author 20% of the population was gone. And that's what you've had in America since Roe versus Wade. And not only that, abortion was the leading cause of death worldwide last year. Uh, 42 million, I believe. Or 41 million. To put it in contrast, we think cancer is awful, right? But it only killed 8.2 million. 5 million died from smoking and 1.7 million died from HIV or AIDS. Or 41 million. To put it even more perspective, that means almost one-fourth of all pregnancies last year worldwide ended in abortion. Twenty-three percent. 
The moral crisis of our day is abortion. It is discrimination based on age and location. It's saying that a human is only valuable if a mother wants to bring him or her to delivery. The baby is not valued because it is objectively human. It is valued only if the mother says it's valuable. The reality is that God alone, since he's the giver of life, only he has a right to give and to take life. Thus, when life is taken, it can only be taken if God has permitted it to be taken. And God has not given mothers the right to abort their babies. God says that babies are made in his image even in the womb. Uh, for example, and so let me, let me give you an example. So my daddy, my daddy's passed away, and he's with the Lord. We put his body in the ground, but he is absent from the body, present with the Lord. So I believe that my daddy in heaven right now does not have a body. I believe he has his soul, and he's still fully human person, but he's without a body. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so I believe my dad is absent from his body. He's present with the Lord. Now, do you believe that your loved ones that are in heaven are human persons? Do you realize that they have less of a body than an embryo does? Your loved ones have less of a body than a human embryo of conception. But yet you believe them to be full human persons. You believe them to be, I mean, just a, as much a human being as you are. And, um, and so that reality, and not only that, but something that's interesting is when you think of Jesus, the Bible talks about Jesus dying for human beings, right? He did not die for the angels. And he did not die for something less than a human being. And so when you start to diminish whether or not an embryo is a human being, you start to speak about who Jesus has died for and what Jesus has died for. And I can't imagine looking at someone and saying, well, Jesus has not died for that clump of cells in your belly, in your womb. Because on the contrary, that baby from conception is a human being that is valuable to God. And so, at the very least, we need to admit, you know, the, the question comes is when, so think of the logic of 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Let me, let me read that to you. Yet we are of good courage. We would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. All right, so if, what he's talking about is death, right? So death is when the soul is taken from the body. So it's not about when the brain stops functioning. It's not about when the heart stops beating. It's about when the soul is taken from the body according to the Bible. Right? So on the flip side of that, the question that we need to be asking about an embryo, is an embryo alive? Well, there's two questions. Is it human? And is it alive? And obviously it's human. I think the DNA that is present there makes that embryo a unique individual from conception. It's a human being. So it is human, and if it's alive, according to the Bible, it has to be in soul. Because if not, it would be dead. In order for a human to be alive, it has to have a soul on earth. It has to. Because if you take the soul, the body dies. And so I believe an embryo is body and soul. Now it's minimal body and soul, but it's still body and soul nevertheless. And I believe the Bible clearly communicates this. Let me read you what uh, standard, this is the standard definition um, in embryonic, in embryology textbooks. This, this, uh, this one comes from uh, the embryology textbook, The Developing Human Being. This is what it says. It says, human development begins at fertilization when a male, I can't pronounce these words, gamete unites with a female gamete to form a single cell or a zygote. This highly special, specialized, totipotent, I'm a southerner, um, cell, mark the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. Unborn children possess from the beginning the DNA that informs a person's unique characteristics. 
In other words, personhood. And again, this is science. So you think of the, the science that was used to make the Roe versus Wade decision 46 years ago. It's outdated. It's outdated. I mean, even from whatever perspective you view this, an embryo is a baby. So the first thing I want you to see is that we are made in God's image. The second thing I want you to see, now this is from Luke 1, 26 through 41. And this is Jesus was truly human from conception. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Sorry. <laughs> just, that one's supposed to come out. Uh, we're in Luke. <laughs> I know in my head, so I turned the right book. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's the third of the Gospels. <laughs> Luke 1, 26 through 41. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, was fully, truly human from conception. Now, it's important for us to see this. Because in order for Jesus to represent the human race, he had to come from Adam's race. And so... <laughs> Uh, Mary is treated as Jesus' mother because she it was her egg that was fertilized by God. Uh, and so you had this human embryo in Mary's belly. And so it's interesting. The angel comes to her, tells her she's going to be pregnant with Emmanuel. And then he tells her, your cousin is six months pregnant. The Bible says there in Luke 1, 26 and 41, that Mary hurries to go to Elizabeth. Says she hurries. So Let's say it took her a few days to a few weeks. Well, when she enters the room um, in Luke 1, 42 through 45, it says Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she explained with a loud cry to Mary, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So evidently, from when the angel told Mary to the time she gets to Elizabeth, Mary has become pregnant with Jesus. Right? Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, in the Greek, concerning my Lord there, he actually uses two curio, which is referring to, I mean, that's the, kurios was used to refer to Christ throughout the New Testament. And so Jesus is truly human. Now, if it's a few days, the embryo hasn't even attached to the uterine wall yet. Right, that takes six, six to ten days. Right? But Jesus is truly human. And if you say that Jesus wasn't truly human, that's heresy. Because you're arguing that at some point, Jesus, he was fully God and fully man, which is orthodox Christology, all right? That's what the church has affirmed, that Jesus is fully God and fully man. If you think that Jesus was something less than fully human or truly human in the womb, you're affirming heresy. You're saying that he was, he became truly human later, but during that time, he's Jesus' clump of sails or um, something less. And um, yet you have Elizabeth by the Holy Spirit calling him calling him Lord, calling him, I mean, this is, this is what he's referred to when he's 33 years old. Same language, same words. He is God the Son incarnate from conception. Jesus Christ was truly human from conception, not at some point later. Truly human from conception all the way, well, even today. So John the Baptist did not leap over what Mary's clump of cells would become he jumped for joy over what her embryo already was, God the Son incarnate. And so we see that not only are men, women, and uh, children created equally valuable by God in His image, regardless of age or location. The second thing is that Jesus was truly human from conception. The third thing I want you to see is that David, King David, was truly human from conception. And you find this in Psalm 139. So if you turn your Bibles to Psalm 139, 13 through 16. And friends, I, I'm passionate about this subject because, well, I've, I've had four children. I've had beautiful nieces and nephews. And in my mind, that's what I'm fighting for. Because I, I believe that Kate and Ava, Ian, Jude, my kids, 
are just older embryos. They're just older embryos. And so I, I, that's why I'm very passionate about this subject. I want to encourage you to consider that David, how he describes himself in Psalm 139, verse 13 through 16. Talking to God, for you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. Now that's probably the only reference. It's the Hebrew word golem. Probably the only reference in the Bible to an embryo, a human embryo. Uh, he, he, the, my translation says unformed substance, but it's in the Hebrew, it's in what they use for embryo. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. And so David is arguing that even at conception, even when he was embryonic, in his embryonic stage, he's using personal pronouns to refer to who he is in that moment. And so who, so who is this embryo before his mother even knows he's pregnant? Well, it's David. That's who it is. Not something less. It's a minimal King David. And not only that, and, and by the way, I believe when I say minimal, I'm meaning body and soul. Body and soul. Um, I believe that in order for an embryo to be alive, it has to be in soul. So God, I believe God creates the soul out of nothing. And so God is involved in every conception. And they, that, by the way, that was actually a debate in church history. Go look up Martin Luther and John Calvin, and they actually disagreed on this. Luther believed that the parents created the soul um, in conception. And Calvin believed that God created the soul out of nothing. And uh, so it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting. Um, so we see that the Bible teaches the value of mankind. We also see that Jesus was fully human from, fully human from conception. We see thirdly that David was fully human from conception. And uh, in Psalm 51, 3 through 6, uh, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to tell you that you, you have this for a reference. Um, David, again, refers to himself when, from conception. He says, in sin did my mother conceive me. And uh, he's referring to him and himself in embryonic stage at conception, using personal pronouns to describe himself. And again, these men were carried along by the Holy Spirit to write in errant truth. And so because of these realities, finally, I want, to, I want to argue that all humans are truly human from conception. You know, if Jesus was truly human from conception, if David was truly human from conception, we can only conclude that all humans are truly human from conception. This means that every human embryo that has ever been conceived or ever will be conceived is a human person, truly human, body and soul, from conception. And because of this reality, all human persons, all human beings, regardless of their age or location, are fully human and therefore have the same value in the eyes of God. And so you and I need to make sure that we value all human beings equally, regardless if they're in the womb or outside the womb. If they're in the nursing home, if they're in a coma, because of age, brain development, etc., that does not determine human personhood. God does. And on earth, to have a Fully alive human person, all you need is a body and a soul. That's it. All you need is a body and a soul. And that's what every girl has. Granted, it's minimal. But these are little persons. These are small persons. These are young persons. So how do we apply this? Well, if all human life is equal, regardless of age or location, you know, how do we respond? Well, First off, I want to speak to those who may have participated in abortions, uh, whether the mother or the father or medical persons. I want you to know that God offers grace to sinners. God offers forgiveness to the guilty. And I, I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul when he was Saul. Do you realize that Saul was at the stoning of Stephen when Stephen was murdered? Saul, possibly, he was at least involved in it. He stood by and it says that the men laid the coats at his feet. And so he probably ordered the stoning of Stephen. And you know what, what's amazing is, is that both Stephen and Paul are in heaven today, enjoying heaven. So you have the murdered and the murderer both enjoying Christ for all eternity. 
together. It's amazing. It's amazing. God's grace. God loves sinners. If you are a sinner, I have good news for you. And even if you have committed this sin, you are no more guilty than I am. You're no more deserving of God's wrath than I am. If God can save me, He can save you. If God can forgive me, He can forgive you. Because I am well, I'm one of the kings of sinners. I'm a wicked man that God has saved. The second thing I want you to see is that we need to fight for body autonomy. We need to fight for body autonomy. Human embryos are human persons. Therefore, they have as much of a right to live as the mothers do. If a miscarriage is the death of a child, and it always is, then an abortion is the murder of a child. And so we need to fight for the body autonomy of the unborn. Um, and not only that, but we need to seek to hold uh, men and women accountable. We need to, listen, we have DNA tests now. We can know who fathers are. Uh, we, need, we don't need to just leave women alone with the responsibility to raise children. We need to hold men accountable. We need to go after lawmakers to hold men accountable. Right? To hold parents accountable for raising their children. The third thing, adopt. All children, whether inside the womb or outside the womb, are of equal value. So consider, regardless of your age, adopting children whose parents cannot or will not take care of them. Fourth, if you don't have the ability um, or the means to adopt, consider mentoring children. Mentoring children who are in need. In this way, we can help parents shepherd their children to maturity. And finally, um, concerning the value of all human beings, regardless of their race. Regardless of race, all men and women are of equal value. All mankind. So we must not discriminate. Rather, we must befriend and love those who do not look like us. For they are as valuable as we are. And so this whole discussion should also cause us to ask the question. Now, I'm not going to answer the question because I believe the answer is very nuanced. And there are probably however many people in here. There's probably that many opinions. But we need to ask the question and answer it. What does valuing American citizens as human persons look like? And on the flip side of that, we also need to ask the question and answer it. What does valuing immigrants as human persons look like? You know, th this discussion helps inform our answers to those questions. And so I want to encourage you to go to the Bible and seek the answer to those questions. And finally, sinners. All persons, regardless of their particular sins they commit, are of equal value. And so we've got to call on the governing authorities to punish evildoers, to punish lawbreakers, while also trying to take the good news to those who have sinned heinously against God and against mankind. In other words, we call the government to do what God has instituted the government to do, which Romans 13 says they do not bear the sword in vain. They're supposed to be um, you know, punishing lawbreakers. But we as the church, our responsibility is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to go to the prisons, to go to the guilty, and to win them to Jesus. That's our responsibility. And so we do not determine who is worthy of the gospel and who isn't, because all of us are unworthy of the gospel. All of us are unworthy of what Christ has done for us. And so with that in mind, let us seek to pour out the grace and love of Christ on the most guilty among us, whether they're in prison or out of prison, wherever they may be, that Jesus can take a dead sinner and resurrect him or her and adopt them. Amen? Amen? So friends, how will we respond in light of this message? How will we respond in light of the truth presented in Scripture? I want to invite you to come as Brother Kenny comes and leads us in a hymn of invitation. I want to invite you to come and pray. If you want to come and be saved, listen Again, come and enjoy the grace that I enjoy. Every day I get up and I'm amazed at that, that God looked upon me with compassion. And look, I've forgotten probably most of the sins I've committed in my life. But He hasn't. And instead of punishing me for them, He sent His Son to die for them. And then He's adopted me into His kingdom. And He'll do the same for you. He will save all those who come to Him. So as we stand and sing, let's enjoy the grace of God and fresh in the Here's that.
she comes, um, she has trusted in Christ with her family, Amen. and she comes to publicly testify to that reality and wants to follow through and believe in baptism. Amen. And so would you say amen? amen. So the reality, I'm going to invite um, Miss Jessica and Brother Michael to come and to stand with her. And Travis, I'm going to invite your family to come up too as well, brother. Let's come and welcome these folks. And uh, I know y'all are super proud, and I'm, I'm sure Daddy will enjoy baptizing his daughter. There's nothing, nothing quite like that at all. Come and welcome Brother Travis. And uh, Brother Travis, I'm praying for you. Rob, I'm praying for you. And I, I'm thankful that the Lord still saves folks and still works in sinners' hearts. And church, this is the this is the greatest thing that we can be involved in, right? I mean, this is. We're talking eternal life. There's nothing more valuable than seeing people, enemies of God, coming into the kingdom. And so it's miraculous. It's amazing. It's amazing. At, that, at this time, I want to turn over to Brother Mike. And, uh, Please keep in mind our evening activities. I mean, youth will meet here at 4. As adults meet here at 4, y'all have time to make it back for kickoff. Um, also, if y'all noticed online this week, uh, four, uh, two from each of our top ten uh, our seniors come to our church. Uh, Emily and Alexi, uh, they made top ten. Alexi got number one, and Emily got number two, and then uh, Mason Hall and John Pitch, they're top ten CCHS. So um, I encourage you to congratulate them when you see them. Uh, hug them. Uh, pay attention to all the different graduation senior stuff coming up right around the corner. Any other announcements? Any other announcements? Let's go Lord and Father, we thank you this day. Father, we thank you for the privilege to come to your house this morning to worship our risen Savior. Uh, Father, we thank you for each individual here today, what they mean to our church. Father, we pray that as we leave this place, Father, you'll put people in our path this week on purpose so we can share the gospel with them. Your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.